Well, welcome again to those of you who just joined us um, uh, to tonight's roundtable discussion on the Arab Spring 10 years on. My name is Jonathan Hill, and I am director of the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies at King's College London. Uh, the Institute it has been around for uh, two or three years and provides a focal point for Middle East research and events across King's College. There's all sorts of interesting activities taking place in a number of departments um, and by a range of academics and PhD students. If you are interested in the region, therefore, I urge you to keep an eye on our Twitter account at King's Middle East or to check out our website for events that are taking place and are coming up, uh, such as tonight's roundtable discussion. Um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce the host of uh, tonight's event, Sir Mark Lyle Grant. He is going to chair the event. Um, Sir Mark uh, qualified as a barrister before having a, a long and distinguished career in the Foreign Commonwealth uh, Development uh, Office of, uh, of the United Kingdom and was serving as the UK's ambassador to the United Nations at the time that the Arab Spring took place. Um, he also served as National Security Advisor to David Cameron and Theresa May, and therefore is uh, perfectly placed to provide uh, a, an expert uh, a, a view of, on what was happening in the region at this, at this critical time. Before I hand over to him, though, just a few words about, about housekeeping and how the, uh, the event will, will, will run. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A function. If you have any questions or comments for the panelists, please can you type them into there and they will do their best to answer them uh, once they've finished speaking. If there is somebody in particular who you would like to respond to your question, please can you specify who that is? Um, the panelists are gonna speak and then there will be a Q and A session, uh, a Q &A session so hopefully um, uh, all, your, all your questions and thoughts will be addressed. Great. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Sir Mark. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everybody. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, I was the British ambassador to the United Nations in 2011, and I can still remember the sense of excitement at developments in the Middle East and North Africa at that time. You know, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Syria, there seemed to be a clamor for democracy, a pushback by ordinary citizens against autocratic and often corrupt leadership. Parallels were drawn with the liberty of Eastern Europe in the 1990s. And it seemed natural for Western democracies to be on the side of the protesters. But in retrospect, I don't think we fully understood the dynamics or the likely consequences of the Arab Spring. In 2011, Egypt, Jordan, Yemen, and Morocco looked to be the most likely candidates for political change. The Gulf states, everyone thought that they would be able to pay their way out of the protests. The more securocratic ones like Libya, Algeria, Syria, would be able to suppress any protests by force. And this analysis proved only partly correct. And looking back, I find it interesting that the only countries in the region relatively untouched by the protest movements were all monarchies. And it'd be interesting to speculate on the reason for that. But also the West, and or certainly the United Kingdom, didn't anticipate fully, firstly, that the Islamists were best placed to benefit from the sudden overthrow of long-standing leaders in the region, including through the electoral process. And secondly, the inherent difficulty of a move to democracy in countries with such weak institutional history. Because we had a belief at the time that democracy itself was such a strong motivator that that would be enough once the ball started rolling. And thirdly, I think we didn't anticipate fully that Western involvement, and especially military involvement, could actually make things worse. 
So looking back 10 years on, the Arab Spring looks very much like a false door. The region looks less stable, more divided, and certainly not more democratic than it was in 2011. The traditional Arab powers never have been weaker. You know, the traditional powers like Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Libya all weakened for one reason or another. And it is non-Arab players like Israel, Turkey, Iran, even outsiders like Russia and China increasingly calling the shots in the region. And arguably there have been wider implications too, as events surrounding the Arab Spring have actually weakened support for the post Second World War rules-based international order, weakening it to the benefit of countries like China. Now that's just a practitioner's view, but to discuss these issues this evening, and indeed many others, we have a very distinguished panel of academic experts. They will make some introductory comments, and then we shall open up the discussion to include um, the audience. So first, I'll turn to Professor Yeroun Gunning. Uh, Yeroun is a professor of Middle Eastern politics and conflict studies in the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies at King's College. And his research focuses on political mobilization with a specific focus on the interplay between Islamist social movements, democratization, religion, political contestation and violence in the Middle East. So over to you, Yeroun. Thank you very much. And thank you for organizing this event. Um, I, in the short time available, I want to highlight three points and I will focus on protest dynamics and especially in Egypt and Lebanon. Um, let me just share my screen for a couple of slides I want to show. Um, to start with, there we go. I hope that this is visible. First, I want to say that the Arab uprisings are not over. Uh, the first wave was followed by subsequent protests, most dramatically in Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon and Iraq where leaders were forced to step down. Syria, Yemen, and until recently, Libya are still embroiled in civil wars. In Morocco, Egypt, Jordan, and the Gulf, regimes have sought to stifle protests with tactics varying from co-optation to brutal repression. According to ACLED, which is one of the most comprehensive protest data sets available, all Arab countries have experienced protests, small and large, in the past three years, from a few in, in the Gulf, which you can see here on the right, to many in, of course, Algeria, Lebanon, Sudan, and Iraq, but also in Morocco and, uh, and Tunisia, less so Egypt and Jordan, and then an outlier for the Gulf in Bahrain. Also, many of these protests are still ongoing. For example, in Lebanon, uh, where COVID and the port explosion have, ex have exacerbated the financial collapse. And so you can see that, that uh, protests have been um, uh, heating up in the last couple of weeks again. Africa showed that uh, uh, they see their professional identity as linked to their political loyalties and uh, they perceive their roles as preachers of the public opinion rather than mere reporters of uh, facts. This is why this role is ambiguous as they act both as supporters of change but also as supporters of autocratic, former uh, autocratic structures. Finally, I can say today that uh, the media landscape uh, shows a continuous confrontation between structural constraints and a nascent agency of change, uh, uh, replicating uh, very much the dynamics in the political arena. Uh, and the current gloomy uh, condition uh, can be understood as a victory for former autocratic cultures. But however, uh, the resilience of the agents of change whether in the community of media or uh, the civil society and the creativity of the expressions of dissent, the resilience, all this indicates that, that uh, the struggle is still ongoing, it's not yet settled in one or in another uh, direction. And I, I would refer here to one quotation uh, from a journalist I recently interviewed uh, from Tunisia, uh, saying uh, to me, uh, we are finally part of the public debate in Tunisia. We are not a strong agent in this arena, but we are supported 
by the few gains from the revolution, albeit they are uh, very fragile, to continue this fight. And thanks to this support, we are not alone in this battle. Uh, I would stop here. Uh, hope I, you know, uh, did not, uh, I was limited to the time allowed, and thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Fatima. And uh, I'll turn back now to uh, Yeroun, uh, who's back with us. Apologies that you were cut off in, uh, in mid-flow, Yeroun, but do you want to continue now? I, I will. Uh, yeah, I don't quite know what happened. But anyway, to continue, so um, I was saying that the Arab uprisings are, are not over and, and showing how protests were still continuing. But I think it's, it's important that, uh, to see that these protests share similarities um, across the last decade in the structural conditions that people face and in the borrowing of slogans and tactics, both between protesters and between elites. There are, of course, differences uh, between protest waves. The 2019 protests tended to demand more far-reaching change and between countries uh, who protests, whether protests are party-led or grassroots, the relationship between armed forces and regime, the type of political system, all of which affect protest outcomes. However, I would argue that there are enough similarities to see the protests as part of a regional series of revolutionary or protest episodes. And moreover, that they are part of a global wave of protests. In 2019, 41 countries experienced significant protests and 110 since 2017. And these protests have been shaped by global dynamics, including the effects of neoliberal policies championed by the IMF and international elites, which then are often carried out by, by kleptocratic local elites. Arab protests have influenced global protests and vice versa. And Arab regimes, meanwhile, draw international support, including for their security forces and are embedded in transnational capital. So the uprisings must be seen in a global context as well. My second point is that although structural conditions may shape protests, protests need agency to work. The first uprisings showed the importance of networks, though not necessarily as expected. In Syria, for example, the initial uprising in Daraa was carried by clan and, and cross-border smuggling networks, not the protest networks typical in social movement studies. Tunisia did not have the well-developed networks that Egyptians had built during the 2000s, but the networks that formed during the 2008 strike, women's groups and familial links facilitated the protest spread. Mass protests also need non-activists, but predicting when this occurs remains difficult as so much is contingent. Conversely, the Egyptian regime's clampdown on oppositional organizations has meant that today's dire structural conditions have been met with relative, relatively limited protests, both in number and duration. The disruptive nature of the earlier protests have put off many non-activists, particularly where protesters occupied public spaces for prolonged periods. Where protests did reach hundreds in 2019, for example, it was often because of the presence of mobilizable networks, though not necessarily activists, for example, factory workers or neighborhood groups. Organization is even more important post-protests. One reason that the Egyptian protest networks failed to shape post-revolution politics is that they did not succeed in shifting from street protest to formal organizations capable of winning elections. This was part ideological, many were self-consciously anti-hierarchy, part organizational, that emerged as fluid semi-underground networks specialized in, in street politics. In Lebanon, the 2019 protesters early on emphasized the importance of organization in part because of the experience of those who have begun to shift from street, street protests to political organization during the 2016 and 2018 elections. The 2022 elections are one focal point to organize around, but much depends on whether they succeed in forging unified party positions from diverse protest networks and classes. And this leads to my final point, tension between classes. While the protesters in 2011 Egypt were united in their opposition to Mubarak, they did not have unified political demands. The majority were motivated by economic grievances, only a minority by political reform, with serious implications for the protest outcome. In Lebanon, the 17 October revolution saw unprecedented participation of the poorer classes, crucial for protest success. But the poor are also most dependent on the clientelistic system that upholds the political elite. One reason that Tripoli became an epicenter of revolution with mass support from the poor is that protesters set up revolutionary kitchens and provided secondhand clothing to make protest possible. 
And it helped also that local politicians initially tried to co-opt the protests rather than um, suppress them. In Beirut, meanwhile, the roadblocks set up downtown became flashpoints for the poor who could not get to work, further complicated by political sectarian dynamics with some parties mobilizing the poor against the protests. The poor ended up selectively supporting protests that did not overtly go against their party bosses, thus limiting support for the more reformist demands of the protest movement. To be successful in changing the political system, protesters need to find alternative ways to provide the desperately needed, the desperately needed services that currently are in control of the political elite without creating new sectarian clientelistic dependencies. This is particularly important for winning elections with which historically depend on clientelism. And the establishment of crowdfunded grassroots networks providing food during the COVID epidemic or helping rebuilding areas destroyed by the 2020 port explosion may be an important step in that direction, as is reviving and transforming workers' unions. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to discussing these things further. Thank you very much, uh, Jeroen, for that very important analysis of some of the different uh, forms of protest that took part in the, in the Arab Spring. Um, I'll now pass to Dr. Shiraz Maha. Um, Dr. Maha is a lecturer in non-state actors in the Department of War Studies and is director of the International Center for the Study of De-Radicalization and Radicalization indeed. He is a historian by training and is primarily interested in the development of Islamic political thought particularly the use of theology by reactionary and militant movements. And he has a particular expertise in the Syrian civil war. Shiraz, over to you. Thank you very much, Pablo, for uh, organizing this as well. In my remarks, um, I wanted to focus very specifically on Syria. That's the uh, country that I've been working on for much of the last 10 years and to contextualize that within the context of the broader Arab uprisings, which a number of my colleagues are talking about today. I really wanted to, in that context as well, focus in on the word legacy, which is part of what we're discussing today. And Samak in his opening remarks mentioned that there was an air of excitement and there was a sense of optimism and indeed momentum for uh, the uprising in Tunisia. But then uh, I think that those feelings became even more um, uh, um, acute and accentuated once uh, we began to see uh, a revolutionary movement emerging in Egypt. And so once we get to Syria and we've seen uh, a number of these uprisings begin and uh, take place, uh, in some places even conclude relatively swiftly uh, across North Africa and even Gaddafi who's out by uh, um, October 2011, then there is a sense of momentum uh, and feeling that, that these regimes will fall. There was a sense that Bashar al-Assad would also have his time uh, sort of numbered. And there were various predictions being made at that point about the extent to which the regime was shaking. And of course, a number of very high profile defections coming in at that time. One of the things I think that you could see in the way that the Syrian regime was able to begin and to maintain its crackdown against that protest movement, was that it was quite successful in fracturing the movement and never really allowing it to develop critical mass as we saw uh, uh, come about elsewhere. And so quite early on, you began to see the movement from this uh, uh, non-violent protest movement. And I think it's important that we understand Syria in that context that what has happened in Syria since 2011 has not been one thing, it's not been static, uh, war or the uprising or the conflict, however you want to characterize it, has not been one thing. It's been different things at different times and taken on different forms and shapes at different moments. And so to that end, you saw this movement um, start to, to accept a reservation of violence in the first instance with uh, things like the Free Syrian Army and then others, uh, uh, sort of Syrians uh, more broadly and ultimately foreign fighters as well. And so the first point was, I think, if we're looking at the legacy of what Syria did, um, we'd already seen uh, um, some recourse to violence in Libya. This became more pronounced, more protracted and much more wide scale uh, in Syria. And so in that first sense, you, you see that movement towards and that reservation of uh, violence, as I say, in that context. The second point is that 
the enduring nature then of what took place in Syria and the way that the conflict became so protracted, and as I say, again, operating on scale that was uh, pretty unprecedented compared to what had occurred uh, uh, in its neighbors, Syria really represented the open sore of those Arab uprisings, the sort of contestation of where things might go. It hadn't immediately failed. It had clearly not succeeded either. And there was this tussle taking place between uh, uh, two sides. I think, and I'll finish uh, on this point so as to you know, give time to the, to the Q&A. Um, what we can see is that the, the sort of consequences and the legacy that comes out of this are, are multiple and, and they take hold then in, in a number of different ways. You have the breakdown of the chemical weapons taboo uh, happening in Syria through the repeated use of those weapons by the regime and um, its ability to, to, to continue and persist down that road, particularly with very little uh, pushback. So you saw uh, a really significant uh, moment in terms of, again, Sir Mark was saying in his opening remarks, referring to the international rules-based order, this part of a much broader assault that we've seen on that uh, international rules-based order taking place by, by a number of different states and actors um, in, in recent years. Uh, and in Syria, that was particularly pronounced and very obvious, as I say, in relation to the chemical weapons taboo. We also had the unprecedented and historic mobilization of foreign terrorist fighters who mobilized from all over the world to travel to join uh, uh, groups, Sunni and Shia, but primarily, of course, uh, in the context in which we've looked at them, joining Sunni groups on the grounds there. And again, uh, in, in a scale and tempo and flow uh, that eclipsed even Afghanistan in the 1980s um, in terms of the sheer tens of thousands of individuals who, who progressed out there. And, you know, that is one element of the conflict which persists and remains with us today. Although uh, ISIS doesn't have its territorial caliphate, we know that there are tens of thousands of women and children currently being detained in northeastern Syria, and around 10,000 men, 2,000 of whom are foreign, uh, be also being detained by the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, in the northeast. Or Idlib in the northwest as well, of course, remains a pocket of uh, um, control um, by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, and so again, a number of uh, um, uh, non-state actor groups present and maintaining a presence there. So that's also very, very important. And then the final point, again, as has been mentioned by my colleagues, that you've seen a shuffle in terms of some of the state actors who have risen to the ascendancy as a result of some of the political turbulence that has occurred in the region after 2011. Then again, I think you can see that most clearly in Syria where Russia has of course emerged as one of the most prominent uh, players and important actors in that conflict, a renewed uh, um, presence of Iran, of course, had pre-existing connections. Those ties have been deepened, strengthened, and in many ways, uh, Tehran has been instrumental in helping Bashar al-Assad perpetuate and maintain his government. And then, of course, we have the Turks and Erdogan as well, who are, in, again, incredibly invested in what is happening in Syria. And so it does represent uh, um, a kind of microcosm of the broader issues, I think, Syria, that we're seeing uh, taking place elsewhere. And the, and the consequences of what has transpired there have, of course, had global uh, resonance. So I'll stop there and hand back to you, Sir Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Shiraz, for those insights into the, uh, the Syrian civil war and linking it to some of the wider geopolitical dynamics as well. Um, we're getting a lot of questions already in the Q&A, but please do keep those coming so that we can get straight to them um, after our next two panellists have uh, spoken. So I'll turn now to Dr. Nina Musgrove, and Nina's research focuses on the uh, Western approaches to Hamas, following Hamas's political participation in 2006, including how Hamas navigated sectarian cleavages in the Middle East following the outbreak of the Syrian civil war. And her latest book, which looks at Hamas during the Arab Spring period, is going to be published later this year. Nina, over to you. Thank you so Mark. Um, it's very nice to see you all. Thank you so Mark for the introduction. Um, yes, so I'm speaking today about Palestine, so not Hamas specifically, and this is very interesting because um, I'm sure if some of you kind of looked at the, the, the agenda for today and you thought, well, the Arab Spring and Palestine, well, it didn't happen there. Um, so um, I'm going to talk to you about why the Arab Spring has still 
been important for the Palestinian territories, even though it did not quite reach. So I'll speak about a few different things. One about the conjecture about the about the Palestinian territories in the Arab Spring, about, you know, there were some uh, questions about why it didn't reach the territories and whether it was going to, and there was some conjecture in 2019 and 2020, more specifically, that it would reach the, the territories. Um, um, so, and then I'll speak about, uh, I'll have to go back to um, the kind of a, a landmark kind of time in 2006 um, to talk about why um, that particular date was important. Um, and then I'll speak about two specific case studies, which are, are specific to Hamas, which kind of link to the Arab Spring. Um, so I'll start at the beginning. So the conjecture about the uh, Palestinian territories in the Arab Spring. Yes, it was arguments that the Arab Spring that was going to finally take place in the Palestinian territories. And there are arguments in particular that it, it, but it, it may not because of the pressure of occupation and how Palestinians were more concerned with um, getting rid of the, of, of the occupation as they saw it um, and more concerned with their sort of general um, domestic politics um, and national unity than they were with actually getting rid of their own leaders. Um, so there was an argument, that there was a reluctance to remove the political elite through violent means. Um, um, and one of the main arguments about um, came from Aaron David Miller when he quoted Yasser Arafat, who said, you shouldn't wait for revolutions in Palestine. Palestinians will always be angrier at the Israelis than they'll ever be at me. And he said, so far, Arafat's, Arafat's been right on target. However, I don't disagree with any of these points, but one, one, one thing that I think it's really important to go back to when we think about the Arab Spring is specifically the importance of Hamas's electoral victory in January 2006. Um, and the significance of this was you had the example of a group which had been deemed terrorist. Um, he went down, down the political route and won these elections, which were announced in January 2006. So the significance was it was it was a, a group deemed terrorist going down the political route. Um, and it was a group that was em embracing political Islam. Um, and there was a feeling in the Palestinian territories that the people had finally spoken. Um, so it would be a huge conceptual and factual leap to argue that the Palestinian territories had already had their version of the Arab Spring. But if we think about what the Arab Spring was for, rather than what it was against, then we can see that the Palestinians had already expressed their dis dissatisfaction with inequality and authoritarianism, and very importantly, endemic corruption. And so these are all things that during the Arab uprisings were the main bones of contention. Um, but they did this and they had the opportunity to do this through democratic rather than violent means. Um, and they did this in the context where they were also supported by the West and particularly in the, in the US, in the context of fostering democracy in the Middle East following 9-11. So, so if, if we look at this as the context as to why we had, we had a group go, go, go down this political route and we cut forward to the Arab Spring, we can see then that Hamas in particular was extremely supportive of the Arab Spring. It voiced its support for um, all the revolutions it considered itself a vanguard of democracy. So it could sort itself as a, ahead of the curve from its, from its own experience. And when I spoke to them, they would say, you know, we got there first, we've been doing this for a while. They consider themselves a more sophisticated organization than other jihadist groups. So they took particular umbrage in this regard about being compared to it, to com be compared with other groups such as Al Qaeda and ISIS. Um, so, so that was very, very important because they thought they, they'd done it already. So from some res in some respects, while the Palestinian ter territories did not have an Arab Spring, they had their own process where these issues were addressed. Um, so if we look at then, so if we look at Hamas specifically, um, and we look to two very different case studies in particular, we'll talk about Egypt and Syria. With Egypt, um, when, when the Freedom and Justice Party came in, in Egypt, Hamas, I think, I think was slightly a bit naive here. It put a huge amount of affiliation on its Muslim Brotherhood affiliation and background, because we have to remember that, that, that Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood rather than a faction of it. Um, and it was started to be the sort of the jihadist, um, the, the Palestinian jihadist wing of, of, the, brother, of the Brotherhood in, in Palestine. So it put a lot of weight um, on this affiliation and thought that um, Egypt coming into power was gonna be extremely beneficial for Hamas um, and for the Palestinian cause. And it turned out that it massively overstated 
the, the strength of this relationship and Egypt and the Freedom and Justice Party had a lot less interest than Hamas had anticipated. So from, from that perspective, there was a lot of conjecture that Hamas was now isolated. But it turns out in the longer run, it wasn't. But at the time, it was a lot of the conjecture was that Hamas is now isolated because it had put too much weight in its relationship. But then with Syria, Shiraz has just spoken to you about the case of Syria. But with Syria, what had happened was Hamas, to, Hamas had had a, its external bureau in Damascus and, and took the view that it could not be seen to be supporting the Assad regime because it had turned against its own people. So it, it felt it would be completely hypocritical to stay and support the Assad regime when it itself had been such a, so pro-democracy, had gone down the democratic route itself um, and could not be seen to be engaging in this. Um, and also had a huge distaste for sectarianism, which it did not want to get itself embroiled into. Um, so there was a time where Hamas in particular it seemed like it was quite isolated and it got it got into trouble with Iran and uh, relations with Syria are massively strained. But over time, these relationships have started to repair themselves slightly. Um, so overall, while, while the Palestinian territories haven't had an Arab Spring, I think it's very important to see that it has, it has been affected. And a group like Hamas, for example, um, has not become, the argument that it has been isolated has become less of a, has become, less of a, a robust argument over time due to Hamas's ability to maneuver in the region and to reformulate its regional alliances and particularly closer in the Middle East rather than more broader internationally. So I'll leave it there for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Nina for reminding us that the Palestine although not apparently from outside being directly affected actually was quite heavily affected by the Arab Spring dynamics uh, elsewhere. Um, our final panelist is Dr. Andreas Krieg. Andreas is a lecturer in the Defence Studies Department at King's and a fellow of the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies. And he spent more than 10 years living, studying and working across the Middle East North Africa region. And his research looks in particular at violent non-state actors in the MENA region and their competition with state authority to provide communal resilience. So over to you, Andreas. Great, thank you very much, much Sir Mark. Um, so I only have five to seven minutes, and so I, I was going to talk about more widely how the Arab Spring impacted the Gulf, but I, I will be more selective. Um, so, you know, when we look at the Gulf, um, you know, the Gulf was obviously proven to be a lot more resilient in many ways than other parts, uh, definitely the old powerhouses of the Arab world. Uh, and I would slightly disagree to say that the Arab world as a whole, all the powerhouses disintegrated. I'd say that the, the center of gravity of the Arab world has shifted from the likes of uh, Syria, Egypt, uh, Iraq, um, or Libya to the shores of the Gulf. And um, that, that had to do with the fact that despite the fact that obviously grievances existed and still exist across the Gulf, and also despite the fact that the rentier system, the rentier states of the Gulf, the Arab monarchies are struggling, were struggling to provide uh, what they promised to provide in the beginning, um, they were still able to deal with the grievances that existed across the Gulf more effectively than those regimes that uh, ultimately failed or are still struggling to cope in, amid um, the, the, the public, uh, the, the weight of public pressure. Um, and, you know, the grievances that existed, particularly in Saudi, in Oman, and also in Bahrain, are very similar to the ones that we already outlined here, mostly socioeconomic in nature, do with corruption, but also to do with uh, participation and uh, the feeling of being alienated by elites and not being able to contribute um, to, um, to policy making. Um, what happened though is with, you know, all these old powerhouses disintegrating, two particular players, I think, came out as the great winners when it comes to the Arab Spring um, from the Gulf. So the old powerhouse of the Gulf was Saudi Arabia, uh, and the two smaller states like Qatar and the United Arab Emirates came out from the Arab Spring as, a more, as more independent players, more powerful players in many ways, and more deterministic and, and a lot more proactive players. Um, and there is something that I, I wrote about in my recent book, uh, Divided Gulf. There is something that's dividing the Gulf, and that's particularly the two visions, two ontological predispositions about how to structure uh, and rebuild the Arab world after the revolutions. And that ontological clash, this ideological clash, is between Doha and Abu Dhabi in particular, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. And they have two entirely 180 degrees 
uh, opposite visions of how to restructure the Arab world, how to provide for the needs of, of the Arab people. And um, on one hand, you have that activism of Qatar, and on the other hand, you've got this counter-revolutionary activism, almost the opposite of activism, coming from the UAE. And initially, UAE and Qatar were obviously on the same side. Both of them were, were asked by the UK and NATO to support the operation in Libya. But very early on in 2011, both kind of went to opposite directions. Qatar, ideologically, uh, not very strategic, but very ideologically in support of the people, as they said. Um, they were help trying to help, trying to build, trying to empower the people versus uh, the old regimes. Uh, the previous emir was very much in favor of trying to usurp and overpower these old regimes, providing uh, a more, uh, more inclusive political um, uh, system for the Arab world that he would describe as democracy, but I think um, you know, most countries would also say today this had nothing to do with, with democracy, but it's more about social justice, more about empowering the people, uh, and thereby empowering the people also against the old regime. Um, and the problem with that, obviously, was the countries weren't strategic. The countries were as blue-eyed in many ways as most partners in the West uh, in terms of thinking where this was going to go. Even their support, obviously, for political Islam and Islamic movements as somewhat a, a, a kind of placeholder for, for this vacuum that was created through the toppling of regimes was also very blue-eyed, very naive, not really thinking far ahead of, of where this would end up. Um, obviously ending up in a slippery slope that by 2013, 14, seeing the countries withdrawing from the from the Arab Spring and withdrawing their activism and saying, you know, we, we kind of failed. Um, and at that point, 2013, we're seeing the Emiratis appearing on stage as the counteractor, counteracting um, that activism that came out of particularly from Qatar, but also obviously supported by Turkey. Um, and Obviously, what the Emiratis are looking at, they're looking at the Arab Spring as not as an opportunity, as the country saw it, but as a fundamental risk and threat to the old order of the Arab world. So they were very much and are still very much interested in restoring the old order of authoritarian stability. While the countries were thinking st stability in the region could only be established um, by uh, empowering the people and creating more sustainable social political relations, uh, which, which are based on pluralism uh, and engagement. Uh, the, the Emiratis are looking at this as, as, as the exact opposite. They're saying empowering the people will lead to revolution, will lead to insurgency, will lead to terrorism, and will lead to weak states. So, you know, the, the Emirati approach is very much a state-centric one, rebuilding the old state, um, and in many ways, very much anti-Islamism, but anti-Islamism is obviously just one element of this. It's not just being against Islamism per se, but it's against being civil against civil society, against the empowerment of the people, and basically restoring order by creating and putting in place certain strongmen um, of the likes that were actually toppled during the revolutions, because they're the only ones who can put a lid on what are essentially uh, a very, very unstable uh, at times in the in the wider Arab world. And so this is basically what led to the divide in the Gulf, in the rift that caused the Gulf crisis between 2017 and earlier this year. Um, but it's also something that divides the entire region. The entire region has now been polarized around, on the one hand, people saying, we need to empower people, we need more liberalization. Part of that is obviously people also saying we need to also have a place for political Islam in this because they are representing part of that voice, part of the mood of the Arabs, so to speak. And on the other hand, we have those who say we don't want empowerment, we don't want political Islam, we don't want more liberalization because more liberalization, more empowerment of the people will lead to more, more chaos. So we want to go back to some sort of stability. I think some of it we're seeing, uh, we've been seeing in, in Egypt in 2013 with in the aftermath of the, uh, of the, of the military coup where people were, real, were, were saying, we actually want to go back to some sort of stability now, uh, even if that means we are, we're making some of, the, some of the things that we developed and achieved are being made um, redundant or undone uh, in the course of this. And uh, I think this divide is somewhat, and you know, I don't want to get into, we can talk about this in the Q&A, but this is kind of that divide that leaves the Arabs at the moment very, very divided. On depending on you know what side are you on, and there's unfortunately through polarization of social media uh, as well, the, there's very little middle ground of compromise um, in in most of these. And, and the counter-revolutionaries in, in most of these crises, the counter-revolutionaries seem to be winning. Um, and you know the the idea of an Arab winter is pretty much reality for the time being. But I'm I'm probably more optimistic to say that in the long run, I don't think that these authoritarians. Authoritarians that came back after the Arab Spring 
are the ones that bring in sustainability in the region. I think they will bring more instability and eventually will probably lead to another Arab Spring 2.0, 3.0, uh, you name it. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Andreas, for that uh, oversight on the on the Gulf dynamics. There are some questions coming in about uh, regionalism, and we'll come back to that uh, a bit later. But I want to start with a, a question, a broader question, uh, which perhaps for Yeroun to, to answer, which is coming from Mohammed uh, Tawfiq Ali uh, about the impact or non-impact, perhaps, of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, on the uprising and the end game for Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, the sort of popular uh, uprisings that are still going on, the, the remnants of the Arab Spring. Will the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, do you think, have any impact at all? Um, I think it is, it's a very good question. But what's interesting, if you look at Lebanon, um, for example, you can see that, that COVID has exacerbated uh, the, kind of the financial crisis and the inequalities. And so it has given uh, people more anger and more grievances. And you can see that in some areas, there's, there, there's more protests on the back of, of what happened with COVID. On the other hand, COVID has also made inequalities worse. And so people who were poor are even poorer, which means they're more dependent on the, on the clientelistic systems that are in place. And therefore, it is more difficult to protest against those systems because then you would have the, 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 kind of the source would, 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 be, would be cut off from you. So, I think a lot will depend on whether the grassroots um, opposition will manage to, to kind of create the structures that can sustain protests, that, that can sustain the poor and, 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 and help them also in, in the kind of the workplace, um, and, um, whether therefore they can sustain this mobilization or whether the kind of the existing system will just um, uh, throttle it and, and, uh, and therefore the, the protests will, will run out of steam. So I think there's a kind of a, um, a, a, a two split there. Just um, thinking sideways about Jordan, I mean, one of the reasons that we had this, this recent um, sort of um, coup proofing, you know, where, where the, 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 the king uh, um, sort of house arrested the, 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 the crown prince or the, the former crown prince, um, that was partly to do with, with, the, with the reactions to COVID um, and, and particularly um, uh, where, where people died because of lack of, of, of oxygen and uh, uh, Prince Hamza went to visit them uh, days before the king visited them. So you can see how, how COVID can uh, provide flash points. Um, and, and if these, these crises are, um, are then being kind of mobilized by, by the protesters, then they could sort of fuel further protests. But I think the, the key issue is still the kind of the, the, the economic structure on it, underneath it, that, that people who get poorer will, will on the one hand be more, um, uh, they would like to protest, but they might, might also be more dependent on existing structures. Good, thank you very much for that. Um, we have a question from Madeline uh, Mezogopian, uh, sort of two linked questions actually about the media, which perhaps for Fatima to, to answer initially. Um, she points to the fact that uh, the financial independence of the media is very important if it's going to not be captured by particular sponsors. And what are the prospects for a seriously sort of independent media uh, in the Middle East? And adds the point about the European Union's flirtation with Turkey, which is one of the worst abusers of, of journalistic freedom. Um, what is that is doing to the supporters of a free media in the region? Fatima, do you want to try that? Uh, yes. Um, um... It's very difficult. I mean, uh, economic uh, sustainability for independent media is extremely difficult. Uh, from my research, most of uh, media stakeholders I interview in this sector, uh, they rely on funding from international organizations that are uh, supporting uh, media freedom. But again, it's a very dangerous game because in countries like Morocco or Egypt, uh, you can you can be accused of being a traitor and of uh, all kind of conspiracy. I mean, it's by law not allowed to have external funds. So it's a very precar precarious uh, situation. And unless uh, they build uh, sustainability, it's very difficult to continue. Uh, especially that the regimes, most of uh, in most of the places, they are able to manipulate. 
uh, advertising uh, revenues. In places like Algeria or Morocco, there were uh, directives to uh, sponsors, uh, to advertisers, that if you put money in this kind of media, then your business will be cut off from the country. Uh, and it was even in the media, so it's, it's not something secret. Uh, now, uh, media development agencies, uh, I mean, are, are trying to help and they are trying to uh, bring a kind of coalition of these agents for change or of these voices for change uh, to work together. But uh, I would say, I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, struggle. Some of them had to leave the region and uh, or their countries and to work from abroad. Uh, and some of them, like Mada Masr, they... Uh, are in Egypt, they are uh, uh, facing tremendous uh, pressure, um, including uh, potential detention, arrest. In Egypt, we have at least 20 journalists uh, in prison and definitely the situation is not better in, uh, in Turkey. Uh, unfortunately, my research is very much focused on North Africa, so uh, I, I cannot give uh, more details about the situation in Turkey, but it's not, not very much uh, better than, uh, than what it is in, in other uh, uh, regions in Zamena, in other countries. Yeah. It doesn't sound as though you're very optimistic, uh, Fatima. <laughs> no, I am, I am optimistic because, I mean, it's, the struggle is ongoing. It's, it's not... Uh, it's not yet the end of it. And, and uh, uh, people like me, like uh, your guests and yourself, we know that there are, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the counter-revolutionary forces are uh, still strong, entrenched. So it's not an easy fight. And I think what the second, if we can call them the second wave of uprising, what they learned that this is not an easy uh, battle and it's not enough to go into social media and uh, to have online active cyber activism to change the situation on the ground. Uh, we need more, we need, we need planning, we need organization, we need coalitions, uh, we need to be able to negotiate. So uh, it's, it's very difficult. Thank you, Fatima. Um, we have a question from Hassan Fouaz, um, which is about uh, Syria and saying that uh, it goes wider than Syria, though, in fact, that whether the link between the Arab Spring and the, and the genesis of ISIS and whether one spawned the other or, or uh, how that interaction uh, worked um, and how it will develop in the future. Um, Shiraz, do you want to have a crack at that, of the Syria focus? Sure, thank you. Um, I suppose there's a few things and there's a few different ways to unpack the phenomenon of ISIS, if, if we want to, to put it in that way, we, you know, it has clear antecedents in obviously the 2003 war in Iraq with obviously not just the rise of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, but also other Sunni groups, jihadist groups that were fighting at the time, which began to recognize the need to work together and to coalesce in order to, um, uh, uh, to be able to resist the surge and various gains that the US was making in terms of trying to push them back. But the real uh, moment of, you could say, hybridity and coming together for these groups was um, the cap their capture and detention uh, and bringing together in Kambuka, where a number of these individuals had the opportunity to strategize about what life would look like if they were able to get out and uh, to regroup. As it happens, of course, that that is precisely what happened. They had the ability, and I think this is important in the context of even other things not related to this topic, talking about a potential US withdrawal from Afghanistan or elsewhere, to think beyond the immediacy of a, a four-year political cycle or something like that. They were able to sit in Iraq and to simply wait to capitalize should an opportunity present itself. And of course, that's precisely what happened. In 2011, across the border in Syria, you begin to have this breakdown of society, this move towards Excuse me, this moves towards increasing desperation, uh, the unraveling of civil society, a greater sectarian tone in that conflict. As I said, uh, courses to and reservations for violence within the context of that uprising. And it was a perfect opportunity for ISIS to go in there and uh, to exploit that situation, which they did to, to, to great effect. So I'm not sure you know, to what extent events maybe elsewhere in the broader region, in Egypt, for example, or things had a direct impact 
on ISIS. I think the move towards violence in Libya showed that there may be instances, because you'd had Tunisia and Egypt up until that point, which had gone on largely without violence. There were obviously sporadic um, instances of violence in, in Egypt, but nothing of the intensity that we saw uh, in Libya and certainly not what we saw later on inside Syria. So um, the, the, that sense of, okay, it may, be, it may be acceptable to fall back on uh, a violent response or, and there may be a legitimate moment in which to fight and, and here's what, what the contours look like. I think all of that benefited ISIS. The final point I'll make is, and I think this is really important for, for current understanding, is if you look at the two major sort of urban centers in which uh, uh, ISIS has, has a foothold in the past, obviously in Mosul and in Raqqa, then the sort of underlying structural issues that uh, the populations of those places were feeling and were exposed to have been accentuated, not uh, uh, diminished as a result of our own military coalition uh, and, and its activity, but also in terms of everything else that has followed. And that is, whilst you can't characterize these conflicts and the situation in Iraq or in Syria as a straightforwardly ethnic issue, as a straightforwardly sectarian issue, as a straightforward jihadist issue, that all of these things are present in different forms and interact with one another in different ways. Certainly the story of Mosul and Raqqa is of the vulnerable Sunni poor in those, uh, in those cities who um, have largely seen those cities blown up, who um, are as desperate, if not more desperate than they were prior to the rise of ISIS. And we have once again brought all these guys together in the SDF detention camps in Northeastern Syria and housed them um, in, in a pretty insecure way with no long-term plan um, so just as the way they reappear and reemerge from Kambuka, they could yet again reappear and reemerge from these camps in uh, uh, northeastern Syria and reimpose themselves over, as I say, these desperate areas where the vulnerable and poor Sunnis uh, are based. And it seems, you know, to that extent, least we haven't learned really the lessons that, that we should have learned after 2003. Uh, and, uh, and that's a very dangerous precedent. Absolutely. Well, thanks, uh, Shiraz, for that. Um, Hassan actually asked a second question about Palestine, which Nina might want to uh, tackle, which is that had there been a sort of successful Arab Spring movement in, in Palestine, would the Palestinian movement itself uh, have advanced its cause any more than it has to date? Uh, thank you for the question, Hassan. Um... Okay, so again, I can unpack this question. If the Arab Spring had taken place and was successful, well, that would depend, first of all, in what kind of, um, I'm trying to pull up the question again, sorry. Um, that would depend on how that, that, would, have, that would have come about. Um, so if there had been an Arab Spring movement and a, a democratic and cohesive organization, it, well, it's just hard to see how that would have played out. So it's quite hypothetical. But um, what did happen was that uh, while they had democratic elections, they had a split between the two, uh, between Hamas and the incumbent political party Fatah, um, which resulted in a kind of a mini civil war about a year and a half after the elections, which resulted in Hamas driving Fatah out of the Gaza Strip mi militarily. So they became sort of two separate kind of parallel governing bodies. And they took a long time to really sort of form, well, still ha have to form a functioning unity government which means that they have been completely split. Um, anyway, so in theory, it was supposed to be a democratic system, but it hasn't worked out that way. So some will, a lot of people now will say that, yes, one of the reasons that they're not making the kind of headway they would like to be is because of the split within their own domestic politics. But your question about if they'd had an Arab Spring movement is harder to answer because it depends how that would have played out and what, how that would have emerged. And I can't quite answer that part of the question. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thanks, Nina. Um, we have a question from Omri Brinner about uh, regionalism. Um, and this is perhaps for Andreas, um, because he asks whether the threat of popular movements, the threat that that posed to the regimes across the region, has it actually promoted increased cooperation between countries and any sense of regionalism? And I'm interested in this question, particularly because I've been struck by the, the, the Arab world being further apart from unity than it's perhaps ever been. I mean, the Arab League seems to me to be completely absent from the international stage at the moment. And although the, the Gulf Cooperation Council has sort of patched up its differences, 
uh, nonetheless, other splits, particularly between the Sunnis and the Shias, have opened up, even in the Gulf. So, uh, Andres, do you think uh, this has been made worse by the Arab Spring, or is there still any chance of some sort of pan-Arab uh, unity? Thank you. That's a great question. Like I said, I mean, this division, this ideational division is something that has divided the Arab League, but has also divided the GCC, frankly. And despite the fact that we've had some sort of reconciliation um, happening over the turn of the year between December and January in the, in the Gulf Corporation Council, you know, not, none of it is, has really been fixed. While Qatar is now talking to Saudi Arabia, the, the ultimate fault line and uh, division is still remains between Doha and Abu Dhabi, and there is actually no real communication going on. Both sides do, will not concede on you know, ideational grounds on, on where they think the, the, the region should move. And obviously the two, um, Qatar is obviously being a lot less activist than they were in the first phase of the Arab Spring, and, and in many ways they've withdrawn. But the UAE are probably the most powerful Arab country, I would say, uh, at this moment in terms of uh, how they use the capacities that they have and the capabilities that they have and how willing and assertive they are in actually uh, putting them, deploying them elsewhere outside the region. Um, so in, in, this in this respect, I, I do think that this clash over ideology of not having a strategy or grand strategy of where you know the country should move to or where the region should go to uh, will lead to more, uh, has led to more polarization, will continue to polarize domestically as well in each single Arab state um, and has definitely completely divided the region. I think there is not a single, so that's ideology. If we look at interests and geostrategic interests as well, I don't think there is a common geostrategic interest that unites the Arab world. There's not even a common threat perception that unites the Arab world at this point in time. And um, obviously extra regional players such as United States, Russia, Iran, um, also play a very important role in this because they don't really bring about a certain umbrella that anybody can uh, or anybody is willing to unite under. And then there isn't a common threat perception even when it comes to Iran. You know, there's a lot of Arab states who see this as an, as an opportunity to actually deal and reach out to Iran. There are others who wouldn't reach out to Iran at all. And uh, there are some who are somewhere in the, somewhere in the middle. Um, and then obviously, and I don't think that has necessarily something to do with the Arab Spring, that the Arab Spring comes at a time um, when the inter international order as a whole is disintegrating um, and, you know, state centrism has somewhat ceased to exist and states compete with non-state actors and, you know, gray zone operations are continuing across the region as we speak. I mean, you know, Israel is attacking Iran and vice versa. There's cyber attacks going on. All that is contributing to a sense of states and countries no longer being as powerful as they were in the past. And then obviously many regimes being weakened by, 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 by social mobilization on the ground. So uh, on, on, so what, what were the constants in this Arab world for, for many decades have now uh, cease to exist, or when they still exist, they have to compete with a lot of uh, other constants and other units of analysis, if you will, which are no longer based on states or territory, but they're based on, you know, being transnational organization, uh, uh, what have you not. So the Arab Spring has just contributed on top to what is already a disintegrating regional order. Thanks, Andreas. Um, Paul Arts has asked a question specifically to uh, Jeroen, um, asking him whether he could elaborate a little bit on the organisational deficiencies and on the tension between classes that you touched upon in your talk. And the background to his question uh, is around the whether one of the main causes of the fail, failure of the uprisings is the poverty of protest, i.e. there's been lots of protests but not much social content. What's your take on that, Jeroen? Yeah, um, I think it's a very interesting um, um, comment that, that, that phrase, the poverty of protest, is by Maget Mandur, um, and it's based on, on, a, on a Gramscian analysis. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is, is that if you look at the, the Middle East, um, and the Middle East is not unique in this, but, but a lot of protest movements of the last 20 years have been um, overtly sort of non-ideological, and um, uh, they've been kind of against one big thing, but then not entirely clear what would be in its stead. So for example, the, um, the, the global justice movement uh, uh, has been sort of anti-neoliberal globalization. Um, and it's it, under this anti kind of label, it, it can mobilize a lot of different groups that may not agree on any, anything else, but it may, they all agree on, they don't like um, uh, neoliberalism. But then what, what do you do when you want to build something in, in, in its stead? And it's the same you can see in Egypt, you can see in Lebanon, um, in, in other places in the Middle East, that uh, it is easier for protest movements to mobilize around this sort of non-ideological core, 
it's much more difficult to then develop a, a program for what to do next. Um, and I think one of the instincts that, that, that Mondur mentions in his article, um, where he talks about this poverty of protest, is that there hasn't really been um, sort of a, a clear ideological development of, of thinking beyond the immediacy of we don't like this regime, we, we want sort of more, more say in politics. Uh, there's been no thinking in terms of the kind of structural changes that need to happen in order for um, sort of a, a more democratic uh, um, um, politics to emerge. And I think this goes back to my early point about uh, the, 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 the importance of, of, uh, of um, 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 clientelism and, and how the kind of political parties are, are, are very much kind of in control of society because of these, 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 these um, patron-client relationships that can go vertically. Unless um, uh, people become less dependent on those, and you have some alternatives and you have therefore structural changes that make it possible for, for people to come to, to vote more independently, you will not have this kind of change that a lot of these, these protesters will want to have. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably the main point. Thanks very much, uh, Ewan. Um, there's a question here, uh, perhaps uh, best for Fatima to answer about uh, Tunisia and saying, how did Tunisia escape an increase of authoritarianism? It's an anonymous question that's come in. Uh, it is uh, it is a successful uh, change of regime or transition or transformation, but it's a very precarious um, it's a very precarious one. I mean, many uh, different um, uh, element um, help this uh, transition. First, you have a a weaker uh, army and security forces compared to Egypt, for example. Uh, uh, you have a solid uh, elite, good education system, a relatively small country with uh, uh, no sectarian divides, as you can see in Iraq or in Lebanon. Uh, however, it's, it's a very fragile uh, process. It's uh, um, Tunisian suffer today from corruption, uh, from poverty, from uh, lack of economic solution, high level of uh, unemployment, uh, continuity of uh, elites, um, a new system of clientelism, uh, where the consensus between uh, political party is, uh, is undermining democracy in a way that it's not about ideology or political leaning, it's much more about interest and about having a part of the cake and uh, media is also engaged in this new system of uh, clientelism is part of it. So it's a very complex uh, uh, scene. And when I ask my uh, interviewees uh, about how they see the future of this transition or, or democratic consolidation, uh, there's lots of anxiety, lots of question mark about how it could survive. Uh, while there is uh, um, insisting that Although we have lots of voices of nostalgia to the old uh, regime, a lot of capture of politics and media, uh, Tunisians are still very much attached to the uh, freedom. And they consider this is uh, uh, the main gain from the revolution. Uh, anything could, can be say, said today in the public debate. Um, uh, we have a, a, a kind of revival of journalism, uh, a very pluralistic uh, political scene, but it's a, it's a very fragmented uh, one as well, uh, 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 which means that, I mean, there are real threat uh, about the future, especially within the economic difficulties that are very real, and it became even worse during the pandemic. Thanks very much, Fatima. Um, another anonymous question here um, about the Syrian-Iranian alliance and how it has changed over the course of the uh, civil war and Arab Spring. Um, one for you, Shiraz, I think. Yeah, I think as I said in my remarks in relation to the Syrian-Iranian relationship, it has intensified and, and deepened and strengthened as a result of this conflict. It's kind of been a historic relationship that's obviously been there for uh, a number of years and for, you know, uh, those who are not watching the region or who are uh, so, so familiar with it, it's obviously one of the, the key points and, and I suppose countries with which uh, Iran has been able to use an air bridge to Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a very important uh, um, proxy for Iran and it's been one of the, the sort of primary ways that, as I say, via uh, Syria, you've been able to see 
um, uh, um, the Iranians, sorry, yeah, Iranians maintained this air bridge. So Syria has always been uh, important. The maintenance of that air bridge has been important since uh, the conflict began. But, you know, again, there are multiple dimensions uh, to this conflict. There is a religious component to this. And clearly we saw the, the rise of uh, very, very uh, sectarian, millenarian movements, ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, attacking Shia shrines, Shia holy sites, um, as you've seen in the past, you know, after 2003 in, uh, in Iraq. And so um, obviously Iran had uh, an interest in protecting those sites and having fighters on the ground in order to protect those sites and, and uh, has been relatively successful in doing, uh, doing so in uh, the Syrian context. Um, and then it's obviously, uh, as I say, about maintaining and, and enhancing those, those structures of power that it's been able to uh, enjoy in, with increased intensity and tempo in Iraq and obviously in Syria as well. So I'd say that's the primary issue. We've seen obviously the need to, to rely upon uh, the Russians and to bring them in, but clearly there's a, there's a good relationship there as well. Um, so I think Russia coming in has been the single most dynamic factor in helping Bashar al-Assad you know, turn the tide of this conflict and turn it away from the attritional phase that it was in through much of 2013, 14 and 15 to one where he's been able to, to wage a more revanchist element of the of the campaign. I think Iran was primarily able to stop the rot. It was able to stop the march on Damascus that had looked uh, potentially possible um, at one point, but it wasn't able to reverse the gains. And uh, and that's where again Iran's I, I think goodwill and and relationship diplomatic relations with with Russia were able to say, you know, have have a piece of the supply too and can kind of reverse. Uh, and that's when you saw the reverse of the, uh, the conflict. So I'd say that's the primary way it's changed. There haven't been, I'd suggest, fundamental changes, but enhancement and a deepening of pre-existing uh, relationships that, that were already there and interests that were already there for Iran to pursue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and there's a question here about Libya. Um, what do you think Libya would look like in the present had the West not militarily intervened? And is there any way to predict this? Um, that's a question I might try and answer myself, because personally, having been there at the start, as it were, in New York, I mean, I'm convinced that had there not been any military intervention by the West, then there would have been a great deal of bloodshed um, in Benghazi, and almost certainly uh, the start of a more or less full-scale civil war in Libya. How that would look 10 years on, of course, is a much more difficult question to answer. And I would be very difficult for me to put my hand on my heart and say that Libya would be uh, better or worse off than it would have been sort of 10 years later. But I am certainly convinced that many, many people would have died who hadn't died. Um, I don't know whether anyone else, Fatima, or anyone wants to uh, say a better answer to that question. Uh, I think it's difficult to answer this question, to predict. Um, well, is it is it, it would it be better to keep Gaddafi and the old regime? I mean, I would say no, uh, definitely not. Uh, how the uh, the operation, how the change of regime happened? I mean, this is where we should look back to lessons uh, learned and to see whether. The international community has provided real, genuine support uh, for Libya, for the civil uh, Libyan civil society uh, to help them grow, go through this uh, difficult time and to avoid uh, the outbreak of civil conflict. But I, I think Andreas had something uh, as well to say. If I may, uh, just a very quick one. First of all, obviously, it's a hypothetical one. Uh, and I, I get this question quite a lot at the Royal College of Defence Studies, especially from our African uh, members who are, who are very much in favour of saying we shouldn't have removed Gaddafi, he should have stayed in power, then we would have had more, um, more, more stability. I, I say to that, um, I think w this is the one case where the West actually took, a, it, it, at least initially, a very decisive approach in trying to, to say we're willing to, obviously, in a bit of mission creep, saying first we want to protect civilians and then saying we... We want to we topple the regime as well and support the opposition and actually doing so militarily. Um, in other cases, such as Syria, we, we, we said we thought it would be too costly to actually do it. And we didn't. 
And all we did is a bit of salami tactics here and there without getting into the details of it. But I think the, the, the alternative to a Libya, the way it has unraveled, would have been a Syria too, which would have been, I would argue, more messy because the regime was already collapsing anyway. It was on the brink of collapse. And obviously, um, you know, it, it would have taken a lot longer to topple the regime. The regime would have been able to, to reinforce using mercenaries from sub-Saharan Africa and so on and so forth. Uh, I think Syria is a get, gr good case study of what happens when the West stays fairly out of it and looks from, from the onset and just, you know, gets involved whenever it su suits them in a very tactical or operational, but never in a strategic way. And the mess of the civil war of Li Syria, although I don't want to compare, I think is a lot worse than the mess that we're seeing in Libya, despite the fact that Libya is obviously very messy. That's why I have five cents to that. Okay. We have about uh, 10 minutes left now. So I'd like to ask uh, the panelists uh, all to chip in on, on uh, some final general questions that have been coming in um, from the, uh, the audience. Um, the first is around US American influence in the region. Um, how crucial is the United States to sustaining current regimes? Is the US losing influence and will the Biden administration be any different from the Trump administration in that respect? And the other question is a broad one around the Arab Spring. Um, would you personally characterize it as a failure and will there ever be an Arab summer? Um, who wants to kick off on that? Nina, do you want to have a crack at those questions? Sorry, thank you, Sir Mark. Um, well, thinking about US involvement, because I was going to put my hand up, and then I remembered that actually, when I think about the Palestinian territories, it's not, it's a bit of a different angle to the question. One thing about uh, US involvement, um, which has been very pertinent to the case of the Palestinian territories back in 2006, pre Arab Spring, has been the opposition to Hamas as a, as a democratically elected um, political party there. So that has been very pertinent. Um, but I'm not speaking to the US, but more broader than that. And then the other part of your question is there well, ever uh, been whether the Arab, Arab Spring has been a failure and will there ever be an Arab summer? Um, not in the near future, I would say. <laughs> Anyone else? Who wants to go next? You're really putting me on the spot with that one. <laughs> Raz, why don't you have a go at those questions? I think Fatima's got her hand up, so I'll, I'll let oh, her sorry, go. Uh, Fatima then. Uh, Fatima or Shiraz, I mean, Shiraz, I will be very short. I don't like the expression of spring or summer or winter. It's a movement of transformation that was led by uh, an appeal, a call for dignity uh, from people. Uh, it was not expected uh, to be easy. If we understood at the time that it's a spring and it's easy, that's our mistake. Uh, and it's only 10 years. So I think it's still very early uh, to, uh, to judge and say it's a, a failure, it's a transformational a continuous uh, movement of struggle and it's, it's uh, not finished. And uh, I mean, Shiraz would, would maybe say the same, but if you look to see, uh, there are some protests still ongoing in Syria under some worst condition in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Algeria. They are every week out in Algeria despite the pandemic. Uh, it's, it's still very early to say it's, it's the end. And whether summer or winter, uh, we will survive. <laughs> I think I have. <laughs> yeah, good point. And and thoughts on the American influence? I think I would leave it to Shiraz on, on this. <laughs> okay, Shiraz. Well, thank. You. I think it's you know Fatima's point is right. The question is so broad as to it's it's very difficult to answer because there's there's two parts. So dynamics that it's, uh, it's 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 more or less impossible for us to to give a meta answer. And, and Fatima is, is absolutely right. In fact, if you look even at areas in Syria now that are nominally reconciled with the regime, there have still been ongoing uh, protests against uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad. So that tells us something just at the very micro level. But even when, when we look at the the U.S. Uh, involvement, then again. You know, the, the calibration of American involvement, American policies, well, we're looking at a 10-year period here, and we've had three different presidents in the United States during that time. 
uh, one of whom I think you know we can describe as, as a highly unusual uh, uh, president. Um, but actually, unusual in one sense, but in the other sense, was very very close to to the Gulf powerhouses, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and uh, uh, restoring a sense of uh, confidence and reassurance that they had wanted after the Obama years. So in that sense, actually, it was a return to a kind of status quo feeling for some of those uh, uh, governments. And in fact, maybe a status quo plus, because in fact, they were getting more uh, of what they wanted, particularly after having felt uh, a degree of exposure uh, um, previously. And again, now with, with President Biden and his administration, I think you can again expect to see a slight recalibration in a way that leaves countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE and those feeling slightly more uh, exposed again, slightly more jittery, I think is, is a, perhaps a, a better term, again, as they will seek to engage the Iranians there. And that might lead to more trade-offs in other places, i.e. in Syria or you know, elsewhere. So I tend to think of this as if you think, you know, US interests, what's the Russian interest, the Iranian interest, it's like the air in a balloon. At different points, different administrations will, will grip the balloon in one part. And what happens is air is displaced to others. The balloon itself has a pop. It's not going anywhere. And, and therefore, the, the particles and molecules within it are moving and different areas are becoming emphasized. Different parts of this structure are becoming, you're coming under greater stress because of the way that you are clamping this balloon. But uh, uh, again, a number of those actors in the region, whether the monarchies, the Iranians, others, you know, are, are there and they see out multiple administrations. And so there's, again, that, that lopsidedness of time and event horizon in the way that some of these actors are thinking and operating. Thank you, um, Shuaz. Um, Maroon, do you have any thoughts on those wider questions? Um, yeah, uh, just to kind of go back to particularly to Fatima's point that this, it's too soon to tell. I mean, uh, these are long transformations uh, that, that can take decades to kind of come through. But also, I would say that there's uh, there's learning. I mean, there's learning on both sides. I mean, you've, you've got authoritarian regimes learning from each other how to be more authoritarian, which would not help the region to, to get to a more kind of transformative politics. But there's also learning on the on side of the protesters. If you look at, at the, 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 the Lebanese protests, for example, they have learned from, from what happened in Egypt in the sense that they're much more focused on, on how to build post-protest uh, post structures you know, that, 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 that can engage in politics. They're, they're um, thinking about um, how, to come, how to transform society, how to create alternative uh, um, services, etc. So I think I'm, I'm mildly optimistic in, in the long run, in, in the sense that, that, that the, um, for a lot of people in the region, once you've had these these mass protests, this is something that, that that you don't think this is possible. I mean, before 2010, this wasn't sort of deemed a possibility within the Middle East, and and now you have had a decade of, of mass protests. So I think this is not something that will go away, um, uh, but it will be a very long, uh, slow process of of, sort of building things on the ground. And as, as Fatima said, not just on social media, although social media have, to have their role to play, but materially sort of on the ground. Thanks very much, Ruin. Andreas. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think there is, it's difficult, like uh, Shiraz said, to come up with a macro picture of saying this is the Arab Spring and this is where it's successful and this is why it's not successful. I think uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of evidence locally that it has been successful and continues to be successful. I think there are a lot of achievements that, you know, the Arab world can cherish. Um, even though at the moment, like I said, we are it's somewhat some, somewhat the at, a, at an Arab winter where the where the um, the regime seems to win, where authoritarianism wins, uh, seems to win. And to come back to Jeroen's uh, Jeroen's point about um, authoritarianism, I think authoritarianism 2.0 is is winning at the moment in those countries that are authoritarian. Obviously, Tunisia I think has is, is a great success country where authoritarianism has lost. Um, I think in Libya, we're on the, on the brink of seeing a bit more pluralism away from authoritarianism. But if we look at Syria, I think the regime in some areas, again, some areas seems to be winning um, they, um, not very, in a not very sophisticated way. But, you know, when we look at Egypt, for example, I think Egypt for me is kind of the embodiment of the new authoritarian regime, very similar to the UAE, uh, where authoritarianism is learning 
how to do repression in a, in, 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 a, in a 21st century way. And here, I think, despite the fact that civil society has been empowered and that mobilization has been empowered, the tools of demobilization and repression have also been modernized to such an extent that at this point in time, regimes are winning. And I, there was a question about China and China's influence in, in the region. And I think one very powerful relationship that's been forged at the moment that nobody's looking at is UAE and China. Um, the UAE have, have become one of the most important, if not the most important client state for the Chinese in the region in terms of procuring information technology, procuring means of subversion uh, that are being used not just domestically in the UAE, because in the UAE, civil society no longer exists at all, but they're exporting it to other countries. They've tried to export it to Libya. They've definitely exported it to Egypt. They're exporting it potentially now to Syria with new relationships being forged there. Um, so there is a authoritarianism 2.0. It becomes increasingly powerful. And despite the fact that obviously we always talk about the media, but the Arab Spring was mobilized through social media. Social media was immensely uh, important in this um, and obviously continues to be important, but it feels like that the regime has completely conquered that domain for the time being. And I think that's something that makes me a bit more worrisome. Um, about the United States, I, I, I do think that the Arab Spring fell into a bracket when, Arab, uh, when, the, when the Obama administration wanted to withdraw anyway. And it's, it fell into a bracket of withdrawal, U.S. withdrawal from the region. The region is no longer, we, we look at three administrations and we see that the Middle East is no longer as important as it used to be. So I think in this kind of context, America has withdrawn. And when it re-engages in, uh, in some areas, it does so in an entirely different manner than it has uh, throughout it, its history. And I think that is a very important uh, a thing to consider because it has created a vacuum that now, and, and to one extent, the Gulf countries are filling because the Americas told the Americans have told the GCC that they have to now bear the burden of conflict in the region more more directly, and so they're doing it uh, in a very divided manner. Uh, and it has allowed others to come in: I I Iran, Russia, Turkey, and to an extent, uh, China as well. So, uh, you know, in in this respect, I think um, I'm slightly optimistic in some areas, but also very pessimistic in others. Yeah, for my own uh, part, I would uh, agree that it's a bit too early to say because the power structures within individual countries and the power structures within the region are very much in, in flux uh, at the moment. Um, but if I could just end with a, a more geopolitical wider uh, point, um, it strikes me that what's interesting about the region, one thing that's interesting about the region is that at a moment when external involvement is probably greater than it's been for some time from countries like um, Israel, Turkey, Iran, but also Russia, China, the US now coming back. This is happening at a time when arguably in geopolitical terms, the Middle East region has never been less important in the sense that it's always had a very small population. It's got a minute uh, economic contribution to the world economy, but also as the world moves away from dependency on fossil fuels and relatively few of the countries have diversified uh, their economies and everyone's focus is on the US-China relationship, it's going to be interesting to see what that means for uh, the dynamic in the Middle East, North Africa region going forward. Because what is absolutely certain is that the geopolitical future the prosperity and security uh, across the world is going to depend over the next 30 years on the US-China relationship. And that relationship will have a direct impact on every region in the world, including uh, Middle East and, and North Africa. Um, I think we'll, we'll end it there because we've reached 7.30, but I want to thank uh, all of the five panelists for their fantastic contributions. And I want to thank all of the audience for uh, joining us this evening um, for this look up, uh, look back at the 10 years of the Arab Spring. So thank you.